This is Chautauqua's seventh annual Robert H. Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court, and it's become one of our most widely known events in legal, judicial, and academic circles. In just a moment, you will hear from John Q. Barrett, the Elizabeth Esplanade Fellow at the Jackson Center. Mr. Barrett is a graduate of Georgetown University and the Harvard Law School. He teaches law at St. John's University. He is the editor of That Man, an insider's portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Justice Jackson's previously unknown memoir of FDR and the New Deal. Mr. Barrett is currently working on a biography of Justice Jackson, which will provide the first insider's account of his year away from the Supreme Court, serving as Chief American Prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Barrett to the podium. Thank you very much, Matt. Good afternoon, friends. Of course, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, today is the anniversary. 65 years ago today, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson gave one of the most eloquent, important, lauded, and remembered speeches in history. He gave it in courtroom 600 in the Palace of Justice, Nuremberg. The date, July 26, 1946, war criminals in the European theater, the U.S. Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg. And his speech, 65 years ago today, was his closing argument to the International Military Tribunal in the trial of the principal Nazi war criminals. But he was, of course, Justice Jackson. He was a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, had been for four years at that point in his life, and his number year was his one year away, a, a wall is a fair way to describe it, performing a presidential assignment that he believed his skills, his citizenship, uh, his interests, and the world required him to accept. He's remembered as perhaps the best writer in the history of the United States Supreme Court. He's remembered as an independent, candid, hard to pigeonhole, very hard to push around justice. And he was all of that already by 1945 when he went to Nuremberg and by 1946 when he summed up at Nuremberg. But he originated here. He, of course, was a Pennsylvania native. He was a New York State lawyer. He was a Democrat. He was a friend of Franklin D. Roosevelt. He became a New Dealer. Thus, 75 years ago next month, we will hit another anniversary. That's the anniversary of Franklin Roosevelt delivering in the amphitheater the I Hate War speech with his being featured young Assistant Attorney General Robert Jackson seated in the second row over the President's shoulder. Now the talk of a Supreme Court appointment for Robert Jackson had begun even by that summer of 1936, the summer of I Hate War. And it picked up and was even more pronounced the next year, the year of court packing, when there was much speculation that Roosevelt succeeded in getting legislation that grew the court one of his new appointees would be his fair-haired boy, if you will, Jackson. The talk continued as Jackson rose to the New Deal, and by late 1939, when Justice Pierce Butler of the U.S. Supreme Court died, there was very serious talk of appointing by then Solicitor General Jackson to the Supreme Court. Now that appointment went to his boss, the Attorney General Frank Murphy, and Jackson ascended to that job, Attorney General, before going on to the Supreme Court. But one of the interesting things about late 1939, in my research, it's the first really pronounced moment of this, is that a Supreme Court vacancy leads to substantial advocacy by women for the appointment of a woman to the United States Supreme Court. 1939. Didn't happen. Frank Murphy happened. Jackson becomes Attorney General. A year later, he joins the court. And of course, that was an all-male court. But Jackson's world, in its time, was not an all-male world. It, of course, had a personal life. He had a wife, a helpmate, a marriage of almost 40 years. He had a daughter who was a brilliant woman and her father's real intellectual peer. He had a series of secretaries in the 1930s and the 1940s who were really glass ceiling victims 
They were women who in later times would have gone to law school and become judges and Supreme Court shortlisters themselves in many cases. Uh, one was a British immigrant who worked for Jackson here in Jamestown, Miss Mellicent Pike. She wrote in a very British style and I assume spoke that way. He had a Department of Justice secretary in the SG's office, Grace Stewart, who interestingly did become a law student and then a lawyer and then a judge on the D.C. courts in the 1940s and 1950s. He had a Frewsburg and then Jamestown secretary who went to Washington to succeed her, Ruth Sternberg, and she worked for Jackson for about seven years. He had a career secretary at the U.S. Supreme Court, Elsie Douglas. Each of them was, in a sense, a professional peer, a partner in the law work of Jackson's world. And unique among the Nuremberg prosecutors, and I think the judges at Nuremberg, he was the one who had a senior female attorney as one of his principal advisors, a State Department lawyer named Catherine Fife. But Robert H. Jackson never had a female colleague who was truly a peer, never one who was a prod, a foil, or indeed a better. He had, in other words, no Sandra Day O'Connor, no Ruth Bader Ginsburg, no Sonia Sotomayor, no Elena Kagan, who was part of his professional and judicial experience. Thus, welcome to the modern world, as I welcome you to Chautauqua's seventh annual Robert H. Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court of the United States. As Matt said, this has indeed become a real brand, a visible feather in Chautauqua's cap, particularly in the circles that it focuses on, the justices, the Supreme Court, its bar, its reporters, and others who are attentive watchers of the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Byron White, who served for 30 plus years from the 1960s to the early 1990s, had a line that is much quoted and I think much accepted as right. Every appointment of a Supreme Court justice creates a new court. Change one, and you've changed the body. Well, since last July, when Jeff Schessel was here delivering the sixth Jackson Lecture, we have a new Supreme Court, because Justice Elena Kagan in August was appointed, confirmed, and succeeded Justice John Paul Stevens. And that new court, this new court, replaced the previous new court, which was created a year earlier, when Justice Sotomayor replaced Justice Souter. That court also had a duration of only one year. And notice the notable characteristic of each of these two new courts, the current one and the previous one, in comparison to the court before that, which li lived from 2006 to 2009. It was the court created when Justice Alito replaced Justice O'Connor. We are now back to a Supreme Court with multiple women justices. The court had, with Justice O'Connor's retirement, of course, only Justice Ginsburg. And then with Sotomayor, became a court again of two women. And with Kate, it is now a court of three women. And someday will be a court of four women. And someday will be a court of five women. Uh, and I hope those Sundays are short intervals, except I'm not looking for anyone to depart the Supreme Court, or obviously wishing ill health of anyone. Uh, but turning to today's speaker, I have to say, in, of course, a couched way, put it in quotation marks, the Supreme Court does have, currently, a fourth woman. Uh, yes, she's not on the bench, but in its life, and especially in its reaches, as it reaches its audiences, including the public, the citizenry, the attentive public, which means, yes, us, Chautauqua. Uh, it's got the voice and the pen of Dolly Lithwick. She, a Canadian, has become, uh, of course, thoroughly American and thoroughly the astute observer and voice describing what that branch of our government is up to. She's a graduate of Yale University and Stanford Law School. She practiced law, and then uh, became a journalist. I think the internet age has done many unexpected things, and sometimes it made journalists out of people who weren't really expected to be journalists. And what Dahlia does on Slate, on NPR, and MSNBC, and Newsweek, and the other places where you've read her, heard her, and watched her, is combine two things that make her that fourth strong female voice, not 
on, but of the Supreme Court. She brilliantly tracks and describes and explains what they are up to. And given the media restrictions that they impose, uh, we need people like her to do that. But she does it with an incredible style. Uh, it includes humor, it includes, I think, sass would be a fair word. Uh, it includes communicative effectiveness, uh, which is, of course, what the Supreme Court is doing when it writes opinions. But I must say, in a lot of cases, their opinions do much, and her opinions do more. <laughs> Thus, it's a true honor, um, on behalf of Chautauqua Institution and the Jackson Center, to welcome Dahlia Lithwick as the second, seventh annual Robert H. Jackson Lecturer on the Supreme Court of the United States. Her topic today is how women are changing the Supreme Court. Dahlia Lithwick. that we can't even have this conversation, this academic conversation, 
without suggesting that we're doing something wrong. And that is something I do ask you to think about. How do we have a less cartoonish conversation about the role of women on the court if we attempt to have that conversation labels you um, a, a racist and a hater of men? So that's all my, my uh, preparatory material. Now I want to tell you that I'm going to organize this speech, and it's very fitting in this space, as a Shakespearean play in five acts. I think there are five eras that I want to talk about here today. And each era, I think, tells us something very, very important about the role of women in the court. So the first era I want to call the different voice. And, and this is in, it begins uh, in 1981, when Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is elevated to the court. Uh, and this is noteworthy in several ways. It's noteworthy largely because she was quite explicitly selected because she was a woman. Uh, Ronald Reagan was fulfilling a campaign pledge to put a woman on the court. There was no pretense uh, that, she, that she was necessarily the best uh, suited person for the job. He promised a woman, he gave us a woman. The other fun piece of that is that O'Connor knew it and had no problem with it. Uh, she hasn't been staggering around for the decades since apologizing for the fact that she was expressly seated at the court because uh, she had a uterus. She celebrates that fact. Uh, she just thinks she's the luckiest lady in the world. And I think it's really interesting to contrast uh, O'Connor's reaction to having been, in effect, an affirmative action choice at the court to, to other folks who've been seated at the court who have a much harder time uh, having been an affirmative action seat at the court. So one thing that I will say about O'Connor is that she instantly became a national icon. She got bags and bags and bags of men. Uh, you know, she, she introduced the lacy jello. Uh, she really came to the court and shook things up instantly with her aerobics classes that she offered as an alternative to, you probably know this, it's not a secret, the Supreme Court has a basketball court on the top floor, uh, known fondly as the highest court in the land. Uh, <laughs> so you laugh, so you don't know, it, it slays people. Uh, so so uh, in response to the judicial basketball games, she introduced the aerobicizing time, and as I understand it, female clerks were frog marched out to aerobicize with Justice O'Connor. Um, but more to the point, I think her jur jurisprudence instantly set off a firestorm because for, for the first time, people wanted to look and see. Here is a woman judging. She's putting her views down on paper. What is she arriving at? What does it all mean? And really, I think it was an effort initially in the academy to sort of unscrew the head of a woman judge and see what was inside. You know, was it all feather boas and bonbons, or was there something, uh, you know, very, very male and, and no different from the men in the court? And the first systemic effort to scrutinize how O'Connor judged, quote, as a woman, uh, came from Professor Susanna Sherry at Vanderbilt University at the time. And she did a study in 1986 in which she looked at all of O'Connor's opinions, bearing in mind this is only five years of data, you know, and she found that, and she was working off a model, you may recall, a very, very famous book that came out in 1982 by Carol Gilligan, uh, who was a psychologist, and she had written a book called In a Different Voice. And it was a book about moral reasoning and gender. And she posits a hypothetical, a, a person's wife is dying, uh, they need a drug, they can't afford the drug, and Carol Gilligan introduced many, 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 many boys and girls and men and women, and she comes to the conclusion uh, that boys all say, steal the drug. Uh, and then girls say, bargain for the drug, talk to the store owner, offer to do his windows if he won't give you the drug. But women are relational, that they try to trade on these feelings and relationships and language to solve problems, and men make quicker moral judgments that are more black and white. So this is a different voice feminism, and it becomes really heartbreaking in, in looking at the time at how we think about gender. So Susanna Sherry imports that thinking onto Sandra Day O'Connor's opinions. And she looks at her opinions and quite systematically determines that O'Connor's opinions for the first time show this ethos that is relational, that is caring. 
caregiving that is other-focused rather than self-focused, uh, that she's not as interested in justice, uh, and wrote Sherry at the time, as she is in sort of solving the problem, bringing everyone to the table. Um, and the markers that Susanna Sherry pointed out really were markers in O'Connor's jurisprudence. So if you look at her religion jurisprudence, for instance, her separation of state and church jurisprudence, O'Connor's very concerned with the outsider, how the outsider feels when they're forced to view a religious icon. Uh, if you look at her, she's very, very case by case. There's no grand unifying Senator Day O'Connor uh, 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 doctrine. What there is is O'Connor solving each case as it comes, uh, one ride only. Um, she's just not really interested in reshaping the way we think about the Constitution. Sherry's view of O'Connor's jurisprudence is that it's just resolving disputes as they come one at a time. And I want to just note that Sherry uh, is criticized almost immediately for two principal uh, objections to this thinking. One is that this is way too broad brush. Right? You can't talk about uh, jurisprudence in this, in this way. Uh, but also that this is celebrating, and this was the criticism of Carol Gilligan, celebrating as virtues in women, things that are not, in fact, virtues in women, such as nurturing and taking care of other people first, and passivity. So there's a lot of blowback to Susanna and Sherry's uh, theory. Uh, but most important, and I really want to flag this for you, O'Connor uses these skills. You can call them relational, other focus, one case only. But whatever they are, she uses them to become the single most important justice on the US Supreme Court. So that by the time O'Connor has retired from the court, she is not only the tie-breaking judge in case after case after case, she is at the center of the court, but more importantly, whole areas of doctrine, abortion, affirmative action, religion, are completely imprinted with her worldview. So she uses these skills. You can call them female, you can call them anything you want. She uses them to become the center of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now here's a footnote on O'Connor. You all probably know that the reason she left the court was that her husband John was extremely ill and she felt she had to step down to take care of him. And I just want to, in your bank, as you think about these issues, think about how often you've heard of male justice is doing the same thing. O'Connor continues to be as vigorous, as passionate, as zealous today as she was when she stepped down. She did step down. Uh, to give care to, to herself, and I think that's worth thinking about. This brings us to our second era, and I'm going to call it, just to be cute, different voices. And this is the advent of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg era. So suddenly there's not one different voice anymore. Now we have two. Uh, 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court, and suddenly you can't say women judges do next anymore because women justices are disagreeing all the time. Uh, there are two different women on the bench, and they couldn't be more different. Uh, O'Connor is crisp to the point of being uh, really, really direct. She's the first person at oral argument, for the years I covered argument, the first person to talk right in. Someone's trying to say, maybe please the go to the court, and there's O'Connor jumping in with a question. Just incredibly uh, uh, aggressive, and I think very, very firm. And Ginsburg is a completely different creature. I once wrote an article about how they do a swearing in at the Supreme Court bar before every oral argument where, where attorneys are sworn in so that they can uh, uh, argue with the court. And all the other eight justices, in my experience, would use that ceremony when people's names were being recited and they're standing and they're taking a bow. Certainly, you know, grandmothers are, are, are weeping in joy, but none of the justices really care. Um, and I, it's a very, very interesting moment because there was Ruth Bader Ginsburg making eye contact with every single person being sworn into the bar. Uh, you know, the other justices are flipping through their notes, preparing for oral argument, uh, drinking from their oversized water glasses. Uh, and Ginsburg is really uh, making a connection. I sort of felt that she was the universal Jewish grandmother, sort of vowing on behalf of everyone. But she had, d d did have this deeply uh, kind of much more feminine uh, air on the bench. If you want to you know, go to those, those cliches, she had a different lacy jabot. Um, but what was really, I think, important about the two of them was that even though they're only separated by a few years chronologically, 
They're separated by an entire generation of feminism. So O'Connor grows up on the dude ranch in Arizona. There's no water. There's no power. She was roping cows before most of us could tie our shoes. And she was proud of that. She was absolutely a cowgirl from the boots to the top of her head. Ginsburg comes up uh, in New York. She is absolutely uh, an icon in the feminist movement, arguing cases at the US Supreme Court about gender discrimination, and actually, in fact, unbelievably effective as an oral argue, uh, argue, uh, advocate of the Supreme Court. And so they come up from a position where O'Connor really does espouse this, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, no one's going to give you a handout. Feminism, Ginsburg comes from a completely different era, a much, I, I think, a later era of feminism, where she really does strongly, strongly the belief that the law itself has to be an engine for gender parity. And one of the most interesting things about uh, O'Connor and Ginsburg is that a study done in 2010 showed they only agree with each other 52% of the time at the court. So really, they were very, very different people. And, and both Ginsburg and O'Connor loved that. They loved the fact that there were two now. And neither spoke for all women, and neither was on the spot to speak for uh, all women. Um, so, so the only other thing I want to say is that I've already described, in general, O'Connor's jurisprudence, which is very, very fact-oriented, problem-oriented, get in, get out, clean it up, move along. Ginsburg could not be more different, much more theoretical, much more working toward uh, sort of worked out, fully realized jurisprudence, much closer to what you might call a Scalia type of jurisprudence, where there's a worldview here that she's trying to create. Uh, so again, the argument that sort of came up from the Susanna Sherry camp that there is a woman's way to be a judge is immediately exploded because they couldn't be more different, not just in terms of outcomes, but in terms of approach. Now, because we had two women in the court and they were so different for so long, people like me were snookered. So snookered that when O'Connor stepped down, and this question bubbled up throughout the country, should she be replaced by a woman? People like me said, no, we don't need it. We've, had our, we've, we've learned our lesson. We see that they're totally different. Pick the best person for the job. Uh, hopefully it's a woman. I'm for that. Uh, but it doesn't need to be a woman's seat. We don't need a woman's seat. That's not what this court is about. A lot of people knew better. Uh, when, when she first heard that John Roberts was tapped for the court, Senator Day O'Connor quipped, well, he's good in every way, except he's not a woman. Laura Bush thought that George Bush should put a woman on the court and was very vocal about it. And CNN, uh, USA Today polls taken at the time showed that 80% of Americans knew I was wrong and thought it was a good idea to replace O'Connor with a woman. Moreover, 13% Absolutely essential. Now, by nominating Harriet Myers to the court, I think that now, now, let's be good. Um, I, think, I think that President Bush established for all time that any woman wasn't going to do it. Uh, it was going to have to be a woman who really, really uh, uh, deserved to be there. Uh, and that leads us to are our third era, uh, which I want to call, and this is a, a powerful one, I want to call indifferent voices. And this is the time in which Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the only woman in the court. And, and in ways, I think, arguably found her voice again as a woman. Uh, so if one woman was enough in 1981, by some strange alchemy, by 2006, it wasn't working anymore. And I've already described to you that Ginsburg was anything but aggressive on the bench. She is the most soft-spoken uh, of the justices. But she was starting to get angry. And I know you all know about the Lily Ledbetter case, the pay discrimination case, uh, where the court determined that uh, a woman who had been discriminated against uh, without her knowledge by Whittier for many, many years just should have known. And she used up her, her time that she should have 
uh, filed a complaint. And sorry if uh, Ms. Ledbetter, if Goodyear actually forbids you from discussing pay with your colleagues. She wouldn't have found out she was being underpaid as compared to her male colleagues had she not received an anonymous note in her box saying, hey, Lily, you're being underpaid compared to your male colleagues. And still the court went forward and said, sorry, no, no way we can help you. And Ginsburg got very, very upset and wrote a blistering dissent. Uh, again, in Stanford versus Carhartt, the so-called partial birth abortion case, where the court determined that, again, the same woman who's supposed to know uh, what is in her colleague's paycheck is not smart enough to know when she really, really, really needs to terminate a pregnancy. And again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg writes a very, very powerful dissent to crying the paternalism of the court's reasoning. And really, I think something snaps in 2009 in the Reddy versus Stafford case. And this is a case about a strip search of a little girl in Arizona who has been suspected of, you may recall, bringing contraband, ready for this, ibuprofen to her school and is part of a vicious ibuprofen ring. Uh, and without calling her parents or discussing it with anyone, this honor student who has never been in trouble before is strip searched by the school administrators uh, and absolutely humiliated. Uh, and for reasons that are not clear, some of the male justices on the bench didn't think, not only didn't think this was serious, but thought it was just a teeny bit funny. Uh, and so there was an amount of humor on the bench, a little towel snapping. Uh, some, of, some of the comments that were made by some of the justices, I think not thoughtlessly or cruelly, but just, eh, what's the difference between strip searching a 13-year-old girl and what I endured in the boys' locker room when I was changing for PE? Kinds of comments that really sent Justice Ginsburg over the bench. I mean, it was enough. That, that they thought this was not worthy of serious consideration, that maybe being strip searched uh, by, by school staff isn't that more fine. Not only did she call them out for it at oral argument, which I've never seen her do before, but then while the case was pending, and query whether this is appropriate, I don't have an answer, gave an interview to Joe Muskupic at USA Today saying, oh my god, who are these people, the men on the she said, don't share certain sensibility and sensitivity of half the population. I mean, this is a huge problem. And I cannot emphasize for you enough how unlike Ruth Bader Ginsburg that kind of comment is. You know she was really upset if she went off the reservation and made a comment in the media about how we need more women on the court. This isn't funny. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that those of us who covered oral argument in that case walked out of oral argument quite certain that the decision would be seven to two to uphold the search. The school, the, the, the Supreme Court as currently constituted really does think that children have almost no right in the school. And it looked that way coming out of argument. I should tell you when the case came down after that USA Today interview and after several of us, I should add, mostly women in the press were very strongly about how this isn't the same as being in phys ed, uh, the case came down eight to one for Savannah Redding. Um, so don't think it doesn't have an impact when you give a statement like that. Again, whether that's proper or not is, is a much harder question. Um, now I want to talk about my fourth era at the court, and I, I like to call this the rise and fall of judicial empathy. Uh, because you may remember for a very brief period in the spring of 2009, empathy was very in at the Supreme Court. And for a brief period, it looked like that might be something we could talk about. Uh, in 2009, when David Souter steps down from the court, President Obama says that what he's seeking in the next nominee is a quality that he thinks is lacking in the court. And he uses the word empathy. He says this is uh, the thing that's missing. This court doesn't understand how real people live in the real world. Uh, you know, most court watchers saw this as, as not very thinly coded language for women. What Obama wants is a woman. Going back to some of that Carol Gilligan material I talked about earlier. I want to be very clear that if you go back and read a 
capacity of hope. Empathy means something to Obama that I think got lost in translation. When President Obama talked about empathy, he said, look, this was the one lesson my grandmother taught me. Don't judge someone unless you've walked a mile in their shoes. This is not bias. It is not put a thumb on the scale for people who look like you. It is empathy does not mean coming with preconceived ideas about who wins and who loses. It simply means, at least in Obama's construction, I think, try really hard to imagine what you don't know about the parties of this dispute. Try to imagine what it would be like to be a girl being strip searched in her school. But Obama promptly gets thumped in the media for trying to float the empathy, uh, uh, the language of empathy. I call it empathy gate. Uh, because you could suddenly, this thing that I was trying to teach my small boys, care about other people's feelings, was a sin. Uh, and it was really interesting because it was very, very quickly imported onto the discussion about Sonny Sotomayor. And in some sense, I think he, he inadvertently set her up. He didn't know, I think, what was going to happen. But that empathy language and the wise Latina woman really created this two-headed hydra where she looked as though she medicated for her empathy problem. That, she, that her empathy was so severe that she couldn't be fair. And that, in fact, she was going to systematically be biased and discriminate based on race and gender every single day of her life. And I want to say two brief things about Sonny Sotomayor. A, she gave the speech in which she said the comments about why Latina women Again, as an academic enterprise, trying very hard to tease out these questions we're trying to tease out here. Does it make a difference to have a woman on the bench? But even more importantly, so my work had been on the federal bench for 18 years. We had a lot of material to examine. We had an enormous amount of work to do in the press and in the Senate to look at who she really was. But we never got out of the wise Latina starting game. For five days, that's all we talked about. Judge Sotomayor, are you biased? Judge Sotomayor, are you biased? And to me, it seemed as though it was a way, of, a not very subtly coded way, of talking about these issues of gender and representativeness and diversity of the court. Now, I want to just briefly digress and look at what the studies say. And I want to start by telling you in answer to the wise Latina question, that the studies are shockingly awful. And that I hope that anyone in the audience who is looking for something to do recreationally uh, pulls together a better study on women and judging, because they're really very fledgling, uh, they're quite new, and most of the data is just very hard to control for only gender in studies about women and judges. Um, so what Sonia Sotomayor said at the time was, you may recall. And she was responding, by the way, to Sandra O'Connor, who has very famously said, I mean, O'Connor doesn't believe in this gender material at all. And O'Connor has famously said, and continues to say, a wise old man and a wise old woman will always arrive at the same conclusion. That's what she knows, that's what she believes. Pushing against that, so when he looks at the studies and says, I would hope that if a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. And that really becomes the thing with which she is almost crucified at her hearing. Um, but if you look at the studies, and this is, I think, the kicker, and it's fascinating, the truth of it is women's brains aren't different from men. Surprise! We decide things the same way. More often than not, female judges and male judges arrive at the same conclusion. The different outcomes that are fascinating, and this is a whole really emerging uh, area of research, come about in studies that show the effect of a woman judge on a panel with two men judges. So women and men don't judge that differently, but the presence of a woman on a three-judge appellate panel with two men changes everything. And the study that starts to think this through is a 2008 study uh, by Christina Boyd and Mark and Lee Epstein. And they find that even though men and women judge the same most of the time, three-judge panels on appeals courts from 1995 to 2002 
male judges are significantly more likely to vote for the plaintiff in a sex discrimination suit, and it's limited to sex discrimination suit, if there's another woman on the panel. And this is very consistent with the 2005 study that's done, uh, that, that is uh, in the Yale Law Journal, that says that uh, in harassment cases, in sexual harassment cases, if there's a female judge on the panel, the likelihood of the plaintiff winning even with two male judges, goes up by 86%. 2000, 2010 study shows, and this is brand new, again, these studies are complicated, it's hard for to control for ideology and politics and everything else. But a 2010 study comes out and says that after Sandra Day O'Connor joined the U.S. Supreme Court, William H. Rehnquist increased his support for the sex discrimination plaintiffs from 25% of the time to 50% of the time. And the last thing I'm going to say, having told you just about the studies, having told you that Ginsburg and O'Connor, in a study that was done in 2010, only agreed on 52% of the cases they heard in their lives. In the gender and abortion cases that they heard sitting together, they agreed 90% of the time. So I want you to think about the possibility, and this is kind of wacky, but it's my thesis, and I'm sticking to it. I want you to think about the possibility that empathy is contagious. That the idea that I really want to impress upon you is not necessarily that we need women judges, but we need women judges to tell men judges what they don't know. To say to them, it's not funny to be strip searched by your school administrator. To say to them, if you ever work at Goodyear Tire, you might know that you don't get an embossed engraved note that says, oh, by the way, management wants to know you to know that you're being discriminated against. The world isn't like that. And so I want to think briefly about the fact that this is an utterly uncontroversial proposition, this contagion theory of jurisprudence. And I want to quote Byron White saying of Thurgood Marshall, quote, being a conservative, he would tell us things that we knew but would rather forget. He told us much that we did not know, simply due to the limitations of our own experiences. Sandra Day O'Connor has made precisely the same point about sitting in public conference with Thurgood Marshall. She said that the single greatest thing he brought was his gift as a raconteur, that he would tell stories. And stories. And he would make the justices understand what it was like to grow up a black child in America. They didn't know. And he told them. And even Justice Scalia has said, once he told us, we knew. And decisions are conformed to new understandings. This is not shocking. It's, I think, a good thing. So I really want you to think about the fact that it's not that women judge differently, but what they bring is this vast set of stories and narratives and explanations that are simply new. My colleague Linda Greenhouse describes it as letting people know what they don't know. And I think that's exactly what we need to support, for people to be told what they don't know. The same quality, by the way, is on display when Samuel Alito testifying at his that he will always feel special solicitude for Italian immigrants because his family were Italian immigrants that were discriminated against. This is the same special solicitude that Clarence Thomas testified at his confirmation hearing that he would show to African Americans. There is nothing wrong with saying, I know things that you don't know, uh, except when you're Sonia Sotomayor. And then it becomes a cardinal sin if you talk about it. I need to complete this, these remarks by telling you about Era 5, assuming that Era 5 doesn't blow away. Era 5 is what I like to call the roller derby. And by that I simply mean that it is all elbows and knees at the Supreme Court this year. Uh, for the first time, having three women at the court uh, has changed everything. And I want to cite one last study to you. And this is a 2006 study that's done by the Wellesley Centers for Women. And they show, not surprisingly, that three is the magic number 
are on corporate boards. And then on corporate boards, the minute a third woman joins the board, all three women speak. And they speak their mind, and nobody is hampered by the paralyzing fear of speaking for all women. They just become people. They belong in the room. And the data is really interesting about how women begin to participate once three is there. And it's very religious, and there's probably all sorts of good reasons for this sort of catalytic reason that three is the magic number. But it was the magic number at the court this year. All of a sudden at the court, you had three completely, fundamentally different women behaving totally differently, but with no apology, with no reservation, no holding back. Um, they talked so much this year. Uh, both Sotomayor and Kagan talked significantly more at oral argument than their predecessors, David Souter and uh, uh, John Paul Stevens do. Council cannot speak at the court anymore uh, because there are so many people piling on to ask questions. Uh, and it's really fun to see the women absolutely mixing it up in there with the men. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg likes to tell the story that for all 13 years that she sat on the bench with Senator Bill O'Connor, not a term went by when someone didn't call Ginsburg O'Connor and O'Connor Ginsburg at oral argument. Doesn't happen anymore. Hasn't happened in two years. That's how Ginsburg knows she, she's having a good day. <laughs> So I just want to tell you very briefly, if I may, that there could be no more different women than the three women who sit on the current Supreme Court. Uh, it is true they vote together at, at more often than not, but their style and their sensibilities couldn't be really more profoundly uh, different across the board. Uh, it's interesting to me, and the subject for another conversation or a question about how it is possible generationally that Ginsburg and O'Connor were the generation who were able to have children uh, and careers and come to the court. Neither Sotomayor nor Kagan could have that life, and it raises really important questions about whether it's possible for a woman with children to be confirmed to the Supreme Court today. But beyond just that, Ginsburg has become, without a doubt, the leader of the liberal wing of the court. She's the most senior member. Uh, and she has been such a strong, strong voice, continuing in that voice of Ledbetter and Redding uh, for women's issues at the court. Uh, I want to just read to you from her Walmart dissent this year. You all know that the court decided by a 5 4 margin that a class action suit against Walmart uh, for pay and wage and, and hiring discrimination could not go forward as constituted. Uh, and and uh, Justice Scalia, looking at the evidence of discrimination, just doesn't find that it's there. Here's Justice Ginsburg dissenting very passionately in the Walmart case, quote, the practice of delegating to supervisors large discretion to make personnel decisions uncontrolled by formal standards has long been known to have the potential to produce disparate effects. Managers, like all humankind, may just be prey to biases of which they are unaware. She's aware that all the managers uh, at Walmart, even though they have an enormous amount of discretion, may simply be acting uh, in sex and gender-based ways and don't know it. That's something that's fairly self-evident to those of us who think about gender discrimination. But she still felt that she had to write an entire dissent about it. I also want to just point you to just not a gender dissent, but an incredibly powerful dissent that she wrote in Connick versus Thompson. And this is the case uh, where prosecutors in uh, New Orleans Parish completely failed to turn over exculpatory evidence. The man who was convicted of a murder he didn't commit was sent to death row four different times, and each time uh, uh, sent back to his cell, almost executed in days of execution. The prosecutor comes out, and the prosecutors didn't turn over blood material that they had that proved that he was innocent. And the court still found that, uh, that the, the suit against the, the, the district attorney who had trained the prosecutors uh, was invalid with the $14 million uh, damages that he had won. Uh, he was not entitled to them. And again, Ginsburg writes the strongest, strongest dissent, saying there is no other way to keep
keep prosecutors to doing their job fairly, other than lawsuits like this, and the court has just thrown that out the window. Sotomayor is very different, very, very powerful. I, 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 the, the most obvious example I can give you, other than the rejection of the Lacey Jabot, neither she nor Kagan will wear that. Uh, but Sotomayor was this enormous, fantastic hearing every day to oral argument. Uh, it's often the size of chandeliers. <laughs> it's really uh, bringing a, a whole new uh, ethos to the court, and she has the personality to match. When, when um, both justices, um, Souter and Alito, came to the court, it took them months, if not years, to be brave enough to ask questions of oral argument. Everyone wondered if Justice Sotomayor would be the same. She quickly allayed those fears by asking 30-some questions at her first oral argument at the court. Uh, and it's about that rate. Uh, she is a power, 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 powerful voice for criminal defendants at the court. She believes so deeply in the purity of the criminal process. And she has written some extraordinary, not just dissents, but dissents from denial of certiorari when the court refuses to take a case. She's made it her business to write, this is why the court should have taken this case. An injustice was done here. And she's found a very powerful voice uh, that I haven't heard at the court. Uh, in a long time. And that brings us to Elena Kagan, who uh, is just so much fun to cover for a lot of reasons, but probably the high watermark was her dissent the very last day of the term in an Arizona public financing case. Uh, she recused herself from a third of the cases this year, so we don't have a great sampling of, of who she is yet. Any case that she worked in on when she was the Solicitor General, she pulled herself out of so she was absent a lot of the time. But here's her dissent in this Arizona public financing case. The plaintiffs bringing the case, she writes, quote, are making a novel argument that Arizona violated the first amendment, their First Amendment rights by dispersing funds to other speakers, even though they could have received but chose to spurn the same financial assistance. Some people might call that close by. <laughs> And Kagan has a pen of fire. She is really a powerful writer, and I think she's going to be an enormous uh, voice on the court, uh, a voice on par with Justice Scalia and Thomas. So I want to conclude with one final plea, and that is making space for women at the court is also going to require making space for Justice's wives. And what that means is that we need to figure out a way for the justices' spouses to have political lives of their own. I want you to think a little bit about Marjorie Brennan, who slowly drank herself to death because she wasn't allowed to stand up and say she didn't like what was being said about her husband. Felix Craig's reporter's wife, and this is all in the new Steve Romeo, uh, Seth Stern biography of Justice Brennan. Felix, Felix Frankfurter's wife was quite literally confined to the upstairs of their home. I think a lot of the justices' wives through a lot of history, I, mean, I know you'll tell us different about Justice Jackson, had miserable, miserable lives for not being allowed to have a voice. And so I urge you, even though you don't maybe necessarily want to hear Ginny Thomas talking about the Tea Party, and I certainly don't want her to call me at 7 in the morning, uh, I really do urge you to think about how we can make space for the spouses of justices at the Supreme Court because their voices matter enormously. And so to conclude, I think what I want to say about women and how they're changing the court is not so much that they are changing the way the court looks. Big hearings notwithstanding, that's not what matters. What matters, and I think it matters forever, is that they're changing the way the court looks at us. And I think that's exactly what good courts should do. I thank you so much uh, for your patience. And I'm happy to take care.
your uh, sons and your husband are failing. <laughs> the question I want to ask you about is this idea of empathy that you talked about. Uh, I had a very close friend who passed away, who was a, a chief judge of the, one of the circuit courts of appeal. And when he does do clerks in, he would tell them to remember the rule of Rachmanus. And for those of you who don't know what Rachmanus means, it means pity, it means compassion. You talked about empathy. And my question is, is empathy or compassion a legitimate component of a Supreme Court justice's judicial thinking and reasoning when he or she comes to a conclusion? And if so, do you think that these three women on the court are going to, uh, uh, you talked about uh, women have much more relational types of approaches than men do. Do you think they're going to, do you think they're going to influence the court in that respect? Uh, should sympathy be a, be a part of these decisions? It, it's a great question, and I, I think I have a three-part answer. Or I will have a third part by the time I get to part two. Um, I, think, I think, you know, and I want to be clear that Susanna Sherry and the studies about women being different in relationship, relational, uh, I think history has shown that that's probably not what's going on. I think subsequent history has shown that those were very early studies uh, and that in fact women, there's no evidence that women across the boards are more empathetic. Uh, to the normative question of should empathy play a part, I think it very much should. But I want to contrast it with the other word you used, which was sympathy. Uh, because empathy I don't think means the same thing as sympathy. And I think we have conflated empathy and sympathy and bias in our conversations about judgment, it seems to be incredibly important. Thank you, first of all, the wonderful talk. It's really learned a lot. Um, it used to be that um, when I wasn't happy with what was happening in Congress, which is now the case, um, I could feel some confidence in looking at the court and saying, well, we have the Supreme Court. But when you have a you know, Justice Thomas, for example, finding out that his wife earned six hundred thousand dollars and he had decided he shouldn't have been reported to the IRS, oops, I made a mistake. Or you have him and Justice Scalia hanging out with the cockroaches before the Citizens United case. Seems to me there's a little ethical problem here, and I wish you'd comment on that. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I have started to call this term at the Supreme Court uh, the year of, of acting extrajudicially because every time we got phone calls to go on cable news it was never about a case. It was about somebody doing something uh, supposedly off the radar and I've never seen the magnitude of extrajudicial activity uh, and comment about it. Uh, you know, I, I mean two things. One, we have a substantive problem which is with the ethics rules which apply to the entire federal judiciary don't apply to the U.S. Supreme Court. They don't. And the, the justices say, well, we take them advice orally, you know, the way we use the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, but they're not bound by them, and that's an enormous problem. Now, there are costs to imposing the ethics rules on justices. There's been a huge move to try to force the justices to be bound by the ethics rules. It's not without cost. Uh, there would be a lot more people. There would be a lot more Uh, in certain cases, another group trying to get Elaine Kagan to recuse herself in certain cases. So one man's ethics is another man's uh, normal life activity, and it's very problematic. Uh, I like the heart of your question because the ethics rules really hold the judges to a different standard, and the standard is uh, the appearance of a man's not a propriety. You don't have to be on the take to be behaving on ethics. The public has to have lost confidence in your ethical conduct. And so I think at the heart of your question, what you're saying is this appears improper. We're seeing an enormous amount of conduct that appears improper. Um, so part of it is going to be thinking about the ethics rules. I think a part of it is that the justices simply haven't caught on to a simple fact that every one of us knows. And that is there are no private spaces in America and then, well, it used to be the case, and I'm sure Professor Barrett will tell you of unbelievable 
shenanigans and hijinks. You know, much worse. You know, justices playing poker with FDR in the White House and talking about cases. Horrible, horrible what we would call misconduct, but no one ever knew. Today, it's an iPhone away. Somebody just snaps a picture of you giving a speech at, at uh, an event. There is no privacy left. Justice Clarence Thomas gave an off-the-record, off-the-book speech at the University of Virginia a few months ago that was explicitly not open to press, and most of it was leaked to Politico the next day. So I think one thing that has to happen is the justices need to start to understand that if they think they can have a secret life of political advocacy, those days are over. Uh, they don't seem as burdened by that problem as you and I right now, but I think we both have to hold them to that standard. But I do think that the larger question is a question about the legitimacy of the court. And when public confidence in the court starts to hurdle, that's the only power the court has, right? They have no sword, they have no purse. What they have is our belief that they're trying to do the right thing. And so it seems to me that the justices, who by the way all give speeches constantly, about how collegial they are, and how non-political they are, and how non-partisan they are, have elided the much harder question, which is they're not behaving like this. And so I think that the really important thing here is that the justices need to hold themselves to a standard that is impossible for any of us to live up to. To always look impartial. But you know what? We're not justices. So they should hold themselves to that standard, I think. At some point, in the near future, uh, constitutionality of dogma and uh, bars on same-sex marriage is going to reach the court. Do you think that uh, gender or sexual orientation will have impact on the justices' votes? The, the gender and sexual orientation of, of the justices of the justices themselves. Yes. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, First of all, there's an interesting foot race to the court, whether it's going to be Prop 8, right, the California uh, Anti-Gay Marriage Initiative, or, or DOMA, the, the, uh, uh, the Defense of, of Marriage Act. It's not clear. As it, it, a year ago, we thought it was clear that the court was going to decide Prop 8 first. Um, now it's not clear which case is going to get to the court first, and, and Prop 8 may be tied up uh, in the California court system for some time. Um, I think that much less important, if you accept the proposition that the only vote that counts is Anthony Kennedy's vote, because I think this will be for for Kennedy at the center, I think much less important than anyone's sexual orientation at the court, I think is Anthony Kennedy's, you know, he's written two of the strongest gay rights opinions ever penned at the court. Uh, I think that he is very well aware that this is a, a, an historic moment, uh, and it's an historic moment where he gets to talk about freedom and dignity, and those are the things he likes to talk about best. So I, I'm going to venture that, and I, you know, don't call your bookie. Uh, if you have a, a Supreme Court bookie, this is not a moment to pull out your phone, but um, I am going to venture that Anthony Kennedy very much wants history to remember him as the person uh, that found uh, for gay rights, be it through DOMA or uh, Prop 8. And I think sexual orientation isn't the issue. I think for him, if you look at the arc of how he's thought about these issues, he thinks about them in terms of dignity. And I think that this is an issue that he will want to be on the right side of what he thinks history is. I think it will come down 5 4 with Kennedy voting with the liberals. Don't call your rookies. <laughs> You, um, uh, one of the interesting things is you're talking as much in the contemporary as far as votes is on. And I think that the history of, of the Supreme Court's power has been the majority opinion, who wrote it and what they wrote about, because it obviously set precedent. Part of the reason why Justice Jackson's eminence has risen since he was in the era of this court, because his, the power of his opinions was so strong when you read back on it. How would you place the four women who have been on the Supreme Court, obviously two are very, very new, but have a record. Um, in terms of the power they've had and the opinions they've heard, um, and how they're going to stand up against each other and maybe how they'll stand up over history compared to what William O. Douglas and, and uh, Charles Evans Hughes and others have done so far. 
uh, particularly O'Connor and Ginsburg, because they've got a longer record. But, but Sotomayor had an 18 year record of writing opinions for the appellate court. What's your view on their power of the pen, as you know, and its history as a precedent setting uh, opinions? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think, I mean, I've probably already betrayed my sense that Justice O'Connor wasn't writing for the history books. That simply, you know, she, she, she could turn a phrase, uh, I know she's a resident here, so I'm being very politic. Uh, I mean, I think she, she could turn, and I should add here, uh, suck up in way that I'm one of the generation of women who went to law school, uh, pretty much because Senator Day O'Connor paved the way. But I, I don't think she was interested in writing for the ages. I think she was interested in getting the thing right. Uh, you know, she had some opinions that I think have been profoundly powerful, uh, but I don't think uh, she's been, you know, the rank of, of the great that Professor Barrett was describing. Uh, I think Ginsburg uh, more so uh, has, been, has been a powerful writer. Uh, Sotomayor has had a few fantastic moments on the bench. I think the one that people are watching with daily breath and going to pay, uh, not just because of the footstool line, uh, I think that she has proven in a very short time to be an incredibly powerful writer. Uh, I think that people have looked at her uh, largely the sense that she wrote this year and think that she is on par with Scalia in terms of economy of words, an ability to toggle back and forth between uh, you know, highbrow uh, doctrine and kind of common guy. You know, she, she was the one who referenced Mortal Kombat uh, in the video games, the violent video games case at the court, which everybody swooned because it proved she actually played a violent video game uh, once in her life. Uh, I think that she is an incredibly deaf and powerful woman, and that there is a sense among poor women, and as you point out, it's premature, that she is going to be to the left of the poor uh, what writers like Scalia and Roberts have been to the right of the court. Justice Stephen Breyer to step down. In fact, 
uh, some articles were written that suggested they should step down now, uh, immediately, you know, yesterday, uh, so that Obama could not only appoint her replacement, but do it now. Uh, in light of how well Congress is functioning right now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say she, she did the wise thing by not putting her trust in, in another confirmation. Uh, she says, she, she, she likes to say that she wants to uh, beat Louis Brandeis' record. Uh, she's 78, he retired when he was, I think, 84. So she was planning on being there for the long haul. I think we should take her at her word that she plans to be there. I know folks worry that she looks frail, and anyone who's seen her at the State of the Union, she looked like she was falling asleep, and she always looks uh, frail, but I can tell you she's a pistol. I've seen no different than I've seen her through you know, certainly her second bout of cancer uh, last year. Um, so I don't see any reason for her to step down. I think she feels like she has really important work she needs to continue to do with the court. And quite frankly, I think that she, neither she nor Breyer, are all that concerned with uh, what liberal academics think about it. I think she'll go when she's ready and not before. I'm in awe of your analytical capabilities, and I thank you for sharing them with us. Would you say more about the question you raised about um, the issue of women being elevated to the court with children? Uh, I, it, it, it's hard to say more simply because uh, it seems such a grim reality. Um, you know, most of the women on Obama's shortlist uh, had no children. Uh, and I think that there is, there are several things that are going on, and I can, I can sort of flick at them, but I don't know exactly what's going on. One thing is, it has become impossible uh, financially and for other reasons for women to do today what O'Connor and Ginsburg did, which is have their babies five minutes out of law school, go back to work the next instant. Uh, not many you probably all know, neither Ginsburg nor O'Connor could get a clerkship, so they both had to hustle to make their own job. Ginsburg had to hide her pregnancy when she was teaching at Rutgers because she wouldn't, she, she wouldn't have been allowed to continue to teach while pregnant. They lived in, I, I mean, I'm looking at you all and you're nodding because you know this era. This is an era that is unrecognizable to me and to women of my generation. Uh, we all waited until we were 37. We had to get our careers first. Uh, we all uh, uh, maybe wanted to take off a year or two years or three years, a luxury that neither of them had. O'Connor used to just pop her sons in the strollers and go canvas uh, uh, you know, in Arizona because she was so politically active. Uh, I don't know a lot of, of women of my era who have really married uh, work and family the way they have. Uh, you know, and, and Ginsburg sort of famously talks about how she married the world's greatest fame, uh, uh, feminist because her husband uh, was the one who did all the cooking in the household. Now, I love my husband, <laughs> I do, but I do a lot of the cooking. So I think that these are really, really hard generational questions about work-life balance, about a generation of women who have deferred having children until they're much older, and then they have young children they can't possibly get onto the federal bench at that point. And the only other thing I would throw into the mix, and I think this is very fundamentally important, is that the women judges that I talk to who might be in the running for a federal judgeship have pretty universally said to me, I would rather make my children walk through fire than watch what happens at those hearings. Uh, so I think the toxicity, and I don't want to suggest that men feel differently. I think most sentient people feel that they would not want their families to go through the, the confirmation process as it's currently organized. But I think that women, particularly women with, with children, are acutely sensitive to what that would do to their families. And so I do think there's a perfect storm uh, that does um, preclude the kind of life arc that Connor and Ginsburg had uh, from being played out now. And I do think it matters a lot uh, that the people at the court don't have children. Um, I think you know having grown children is quite different from having young children. And if ever I had evidence of that, it was watching Chief Justice Roberts in the violent video games case 
and his kids are only slightly older than mine. And he really was the only one in the room, I think, who understood what, what happens to children uh, when their mommy is working and their daddy is working and they're home and there's a violent video tape case. And there's no option but to think about can the state play a role in this? Uh, the other justices were looking at theoretically. You could see in the Chief Justice's eyes, this isn't a theoretical question, this is about his kids. So I think it's really important to have parents on the court. Uh, given the recent tendency of what I like to call a gang of five in decreasing federalism and increasing states' rights, do you, can you predict any scenario by which Obamacare would be held up by it? It would be passed by a majority of the court? I think, I feel very strongly that Obamacare will be upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that what we've seen in the fights over the ACA are an enormous dust up that happened over a handful of federal judges writing a handful of opinions uh, striking it down. But I think by and large, if you look at the court's opinion on rage, on the medicinal marijuana case, if you look at the court's opinions in Morrison and Lopez, and the, the sort of progression of the court's federalism jurisprudence, I think it is very hard to imagine five votes to strike it down. Uh, I think the conversation has ramped up. I think that court watchers have been saying for a year and a half since the first uh, 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 lawsuits were filed uh, that this was going to be 8 to 1, 7 to 2, upholding it. I think most of those same court watchers continue to say it will be 8 to 1, 7 to 2, upholding it. I think that, that the Chief Justice, I, I hear you, uh, but I will say this, I think the Chief Justice uh, is incredibly concerned, and this is something he inherited from Chief Justice Rehnquist, for whom he clerked. He is incredibly concerned with the supremacy of the court and the dignity of the court and the role of the court. And I think that the same reason that um, Rehnquist refused to do away with the Miranda right, even though it killed him, because the court doesn't do things like that, may well be the reason that the Chief Justice will not strike down Obama's I love your idea of um, empathy creep or empathy rubbing off on the male justices from the women coming on the court. And when you talk about the three is the number that changes things, I was uh, thinking about um, the, uh, the idea that 30% in any culture is the tipping point. You get 30% in a certain direction and, and the whole culture starts to move. Um, I work at a university and we work on gender justice issues. And one of the things we find is that when in all male cultures, things go one way and it's usually more violent and more uh, uh, acting out sometimes. And that, um, and we're thinking especially of athletic departments and fraternities and to a certain degree, ROTC, although there's a lot of women there and so it's less and less that way. And I wonder, your idea of the empathy rubbing off on the men, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it isn't just that men are more careful when women are around, that the, what they, and maybe you have some insights as to what the culture inside the conversations are like when the judges are discussing cases. What, how, do, are they just more careful? Do they talk less in, um, I don't know. Are they more careful to act like they understand what the women understand? Uh, I, I love that question. Uh, I, I mean, I think, um, I, I want to believe, I need to believe that it's not just that they're more careful, but that they learn something. I mean, one problem we're always going to have with these, with these sort of counterfactuals is that we don't get to see uh, what happens at conferences until long, long after, uh, you know, the justice, the development of justice is and we get to know uh, what was said. Um, but, I, you know, I think I, I also want to say that we have to remember, and I should have said this at the beginning of my talk, that it was an all-male court that decided Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, it was an all-male court, court that decided Griswold. Uh, and that I don't think that uh, there needs to be a woman in the room so that the men behave better. And it goes to something Professor Barrett said that's so important. Um, long before there were women on the bench, women were influencing the men on the bench. They were doing it as 
doing law clerks as wives, they were doing it as secretaries and daughters. And so I think that, you know, my notion that I think empathy is contagious isn't entirely confined to being on the bed. I think that I really do believe that uh, all of us can stand to be reminded of what we don't know about other people and that it's not just conforming our behavior to not look like a lout. Uh, I think most of us, when we learn, when we learn that there are real consequences that we didn't think about, uh, are better.